talk about a, a change in the nature of the Cold War in the 1950s. We want to remember that 1949, 1950, is, it's a watershed year. Uh, before that time, the Cold War is centered on what part of the world? Europe. Europe, very good. Uh, the question is Germany. Does Germany get reunited and do they become in the Soviet sphere? Reunited in the Western sphere. Um, and ultimately, the solution to that question was what? No reunification. Very good. Uh, it's just going to be a permanent division between East and West Germany. In 1949, the focus of the Cold War moves to Asia, with China becoming communist. Also, at the same time, we've got the end of the American nuclear monopoly when the Soviet Union detonates their atomic bomb in August of 1949. In the summer of 1950, we have a beginning of a war in Korea, and that war will be fought for three years. We're also, in the 1950s, supporting a, a war in Vietnam. I'm going to talk much more about this after, after Christmas break. Uh, we'll get, you know, get back to Vietnam. But for today's purposes, please know that, that from 1945 to 1954, the French were fighting in Vietnam. The French were fighting against Vietnamese nationalists to maintain control of their colony. And in light of the United States feeling that all communism was coming out of Moscow, Moscow was pulling the strings for all communism, and that supported an increase in military expenditures from the United States, and this was all dictated by National <laughs> Security Council Report 68, very good. The United States started pumping money into the French so they could fight Vietnamese nationalists in Vietnam. By the end of the French war in Vietnam, by the end of the French War in Vietnam, by 1954, the United States was funding over 70% of the French military equipment that they were using to fight the Vietnamese nationalists. So we've got a, a new Cold War in the 1950s. And we're going to add to that a change in leadership, uh, both in the United States and in the Soviet Union. And let's start with our own country. In 1952, November of 1952, there's a presidential election. Republican, Harry, uh, pardon me, Republican uh, Dwight Eisenhower, seen here, is going to be running against a Democratic candidate named, anybody? Adlai Stevenson. So the rivalry between Eisenhower and Stevenson that we know in our community actually began in presidential politics in the 1950s. Stevenson, of course, is going to lose. It happens. Stevenson is going to lose, and he runs again in 1956. Well, I guess... He runs again in 1956 against Eisenhower, and he loses again. So at least in the political arena, Eisenhower was dominant over Stevenson. Uh, for Quiz Bowl, though, well, I guess, I, I guess we can't. I, I used to teach at Stevenson, so, uh, but um, I don't know. There was no presidential candidate UAIS, so it doesn't much matter. <laughs> Anyhow, we've got a new president of the United States. It is Dwight Eisenhower. We know Dwight Eisenhower because he was the supreme allied commander uh, in, uh, in Europe during the Second World War. He was the guy that orchestrated Operation Overlord, the, the D-Day invasions of Normandy. So he's a military hero. He's also a Republican. So it's going to be doubtful that he's going to be accused by Republicans, at least, who have been doing all the accusing of Harry Truman being soft on communism. It's doubtful that Eisenhower will ever be accused, at least by Republicans, of being soft on communism. While Eisenhower initially supports an idea to roll back communism, to push it back from where it is, he quickly moves to continuing the containment policies of his predecessor. So Eisenhower will be a containment president as well, to contain communism where it is with the belief that the Soviet system is a failed system on its own. And you need not defeat it militarily to defeat Soviet communism. That it will just eventually collapse on its own. As long as you contain it, you keep it from growing. So what started with George Kennan continues with Truman, will now continue with a Republican president, Eisenhower, in the continuation of American containment policy. Yeah. Yeah, save that though. Save that thought for a month from now. But basically, that's, that's a majority of the reason there. Eisenhower's policy towards containing communism is known as Eisenhower's new look. 
the new look towards containment. Because his containment isn't quite exactly the same as, um, as President Truman's containment. So I'm going to give you a handful of things that uh, encompass Eisenhower's new look in containing communism. I'll talk about this guy in a second. This is Eisenhower's Secretary of State, a guy named John Foster Dulles. I'll, I'll come back to him in a couple minutes. Don't worry about him right now. So with regard to Eisenhower's new look, first we're going to develop a new uh, international treaty organization, a defensive alliance called CETO. And you can see that represented in um, these blue nations of the world. Um, these are blue at this time because they're French colonies. All right? So we'll worry about them later. CETO, the Southeast Asian Treaty Organization. Now, I know what you're saying, Mr. Doby, right now. I know what you're saying right now. Mr. Doby, you talked about CETO the other day when it was the Korean War. All right. Presidential election is in, Feb is in uh, November of 1952. Eisenhower takes office in January of 1953. The Korean War is still going on at this time. The Korean War doesn't come to an end until the summer of 53. So Eisenhower is now in office at the very end of the Korean War. So after the Korean War, we developed CETO, the Southeast Asian Treaty Organization. It's a parallel organization to NATO in the North Atlantic. And it means that if any communist country threatens any NATO nation or now any CETO nation, then all of the CETO nations or all of the NATO nations have to join together in defense of that state. Now, the United States just has the added bonus of being a member of both. Yes, sir. Why wasn't Taiwan part of it? That that's a good question. Um, and, and my guess is one of two things. And I, I don't have a good answer for you, but I'm going to give you my guesses. Either the map is wrong, and it should have colored in Taiwan, or because Taiwan was not actually recognized as an independent nation um, at this point. It, it, it's very tricky. Um, I, I'm, that's what I'm going to go with at that. It wasn't recognized on a global scene. The United States saw the government of Taiwan as the legitimate China, Taiwanese government, or Chinese government, but the rest of the world didn't. Like, for example, um, France, for example, I, I, quite early on recognized Mao Zedong's China. So I think that's where that issue lies. Um, so anyway, we're going to encircle the Soviet Union with the creation of CETO and the continued and now strengthening NATO. NATO is going to be made stronger after the Korean War because we're going to admit West Germany into NATO in 1954. So we're strengthening NATO and now we're creating CETO. And so we've got these communist superpowers bookended. We are going to increase the military power of those European nations that might be threatened by communism. For example, West Germany, and in particular, West Berlin. West Berlin that's surrounded by communist East Berlin. West Germany that borders communist East Germany. You can see how the Korean example might make the people of West Germany kind of nervous, right? Temporary division in Korea, temporary division formerly in Germany. North Korea invades South Korea. It's not beyond the realm of possibility that West Germans could imagine an invasion coming from East Germany. So as another part of the new look, Eisenhower will start pumping more military aid into West Germany and allow West Germany into NATO, saying, if any country threatens NATO, all NATO nations must defend it. We're going to begin assisting other nations that are fighting communist forces. And this is primarily, at this point, in Vietnam. Early on, we support the French in fighting their war against Vietnamese nationalists. But as most of those Vietnamese nationalists are also communists, we begin to, it, it begins to become a, a part of the Cold War story. And by 1956, after that French war in Vietnam is over, the United States starts supporting the government of South Vietnam, the non-communist government of South Vietnam, against the new communist government of North Vietnam. We'll talk much more about Vietnam in a couple weeks, so don't worry if you're not 100% clear on that right now. The story will all make sense very soon. Another aspect of Eisenhower's new look towards communism is using our new CIA. Remember we talked about the development of the Central Intelligence Agency? We did that back in 1947 with uh, 
when the United States created uh, when the National Defense Act and we created the a Department of Defense, we created the CIA, we created the National Security Council. The CIA is America's foreign intelligence operation. They're our spy organization. But Eisenhower started to use the CIA for covert operations. When I say covert operations, these are like, like an overt operation is me walking right up to Sebastian and whacking him on the head. He sees me coming. He sees what's happening. Everybody's witnessed it. We know who did it. But if I were to, under the table, conspire with Kevin, sitting next to Sebastian there, to whack Sebastian on the head, and Kevin might do it, and Sebastian knows Kevin hit him, but he doesn't know that I'm connected to it. <laughs> All right. It could happen at any time, Sebastian. Yep, yep. Uh, he's quick. Trust me. Okay. He, he's, uh, oh, don't, don't, play all your, don't lay all your hands on the table. Keep something secret. So anyway, Eisenhower is going to start using the CIA for covert operations uh, for different purposes. For example, if there is a government that is maybe a communist government or, or we believe could possibly turn to the Soviet Union for support, we might use the CIA to orchestrate the overthrow of that leader. Here's a photograph uh, following the Iranian coup of 1953, when the United States CIA supported the ouster of a Soviet-friendly socialist leader of, of Iran to replace him with an American-friendly leader of Iran. We'll talk more about this at a later date as well. But part of the... Fast forward 25 years down the road, in 1979, there's an Iranian revolution that overthrows the American-supported government of Iran. So all of this stuff started back in the 1950s when the United States CIA aided rebel groups in Iran to, to overthrow um, the current leader of Iran there. Yes? What was the name of the Iranian? Mo Mohammad Mossadegh. Okay. And then he's replaced with uh, Reza Pahlavi, yeah, the Shah of Iran. So anyway, the United States is going to start using the CIA, and it's not just in Iran. Uh, Latin America, for example, we are very active in trying to influence the governments of Latin America to keep them either pro-American or keep them at least out of the Soviets' pockets. The new look will also call for an increased reliance on nuclear weapons. President Eisenhower will call for a dramatic increase of the nuclear arsenal and capabilities of the United States. That is not just more bombs and the development of, of, of new missiles and rocket systems, but also new airplanes, new, new bombers, long-range bombers, planes that can take off in the United States and fly all the way to the Soviet Union and... and um, without, without ever having the need to refuel, we are going to dramatically increase our nuclear capabilities. Eisenhower's idea here was that the United States needed to have and maintain what was called first strike capability. We had to forever have the ability to launch a strike at the Soviet Union before they could ever launch one at us. And we felt we could have that because we had friends around the world. We had CETO allies. We had NATO allies. And we had our weapon systems and our bombers and eventually our missiles in those countries. For example, Turkey. We, Turkey borders the Soviet Union. We had missiles in Turkey. And that, that, was, that gave us excellent first strike capability against, Turkey, or against uh, the Soviet Union. Pardon me. So Eisenhower wanted to dramatically increase our nuclear capability because if you can increase the nuclear arsenal you can actually start to draw down some of your conventional forces. And Eisenhower really wanted to do that because conventional forces are expensive. I'm going to talk more about that in a moment. But just know with the new look, it was to increase our nuclear arsenal. This goes hand in hand with the Eisenhower policy of brinkmanship. So think of brinkmanship as a part of the new look. As stated by our Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles, Brinkmanship is the ability to get to the verge, get to the verge of war, get to the verge of nuclear warfare, without getting into the war. That is brinkmanship. To get to the brink, to get your opponent to back down. To do this, we would develop the most devastating nuclear arsenal mankind had ever known, and we threaten to use it. 
If, for example, there's a communist threat to one of our allies, we would respond with a threat of what we would call massive retaliation. That we will retaliate and it will be devastating. And the United States has already proved that we would use atomic weapons in Japan. So we threaten massive retaliation. Not because we wanted to do it, but because we felt that threatening massive retaliation and having the evidence that we could actually do it, like having a nuclear arsenal capable of doing it, would get our opponents to back down. All right? This is a very dangerous game of poker right here. Right? We threaten massive retaliation in hopes of getting our opponent to, to back down. Because what did George Kennan a long time ago tell us about the Soviet Union? They were hostile to us, but not... So they'll ultimately back down, we believed. That's brinkmanship. Now, you can kind of play this thought game in your head. What if they didn't back down? Would we really do this? We didn't get to that point, fortunately, right, where we had to answer that question. So this is where we are at with the uh, Eisenhower new look towards communism. Everybody good? Now, despite this seemingly aggressive stance, oh, let me add one more thing, which is not actually a part of his new look towards containment, but just a reminder that the Cold War is still impacting American society. In 1954, do you remember we talked last week about the McCarran Internal Security Act that, that had the United States create a list of communist organizations that allowed for communists, uh, communists to be questioned before a board uh, to, to find out what their subversive activities might have been? We're going to push this even further. In 1954, Congress will pass and the President, now Eisenhower, will sign what's called the Communist Control Act which makes it illegal, after that act is signed, which makes it illegal for the Communist Party of the United States to exist. And it makes it illegal for an individual to be a member of a communist organization in the United States. We have some serious, I hear mumblings here, we have some serious freedom of speech issues, right? Like, no free association here if you can't belong to any, any organization that you would want to. And this certainly is something that makes us think about current events as, as they're unfolding right now. So please understand that the containment policy of Eisenhower, this new look towards communism, we absolutely want to contain communism overseas. But at home, we are also still quite concerned about communist threats inside the United States. In the back? The Communist Control Act. Hmm. President signed it. Every senator voted for it. All but two members of the House of Representatives voted for it. So the climate in America in 1954 was still vehemently set in the Red Scare uh, that, uh, that started maybe in the late 40s. Yeah. Um, is this act still today or No, it's gone. You can be a communist today. Okay. All right. But we, the Soviet Union doesn't exist anymore, so that threat is gone, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I believe it started getting chipped away in the 1960s, but I am I'm no expert on that. I, same with the, uh, the McCarran Internal Security Act. Um, all right. Despite this aggressive stance towards communism, Eisenhower was well aware of the real dangers that nuclear warfare brought with them. And he was absolutely prepared to speak to the Soviet Union, to negotiate with them. So he understands the threats, because he's seen nuclear war. And he's willing to talk to the Soviets. And there would actually be two meetings between the United States and the Soviet Union in the 1950s. First in 1955 in Geneva, Switzerland. Second in 1959 in Washington, D.C. So they would actually talk. And these would be the first meetings that the United States and the Soviet Union would have since the last meeting of World War II, which was what? Potsdam. So Potsdam was in July of 45. It would be 10 years before the leader of the Soviets and the leader of the Americans would speak again. Speak again. 55 in Geneva and 59 in D.C. Geneva's in Switzerland. All right. The Soviet Union gets a new leader. The Soviet Union gets a new leader. Nikita Khrushchev. 
Got it spelled here for you. K-H-R-U-S-H-C-H-E-V. If you're playing Wheel of Fortune and you have Soviet leaders, go for the H. All right. Nikita Khrushchev. Stalin dies in 1953. Actually, Stalin dies before the end of the Korean War. And some argue that Stalin's death allows that Korean War to ultimately come to an end. Stalin dies in 1953. It's going to be a couple years of political struggle in the Soviet Union. And ultimately, Nikita Khrushchev rises out of that competition for control. Khrushchev, like Eisenhower, sees the, the, the reality of the Cold War as a very dangerous one. Now that not only the Soviet Union, but America, obviously, is growing their nuclear arsenal. You can't just go to war anymore. All right? That can't be an option on the table. So like Eisenhower, who's willing to attempt to contain communism in hopes that it would one day die out on its own, Khrushchev is going to speak the same game. And he calls for a peaceful coexistence with the United States. So we want to associate Khrushchev with peaceful coexistence. Sounds nice, right? Now, when we peel back a layer of that, we understand that Khrushchev wants peaceful coexistence with the United States because he believes that if it's left on its own, that capitalism will destroy the United States on its own. You don't, so he, he thinks ultimately the United States system should collapse, but he just doesn't think it takes war to get there. He thinks it will die out on its own. Yes, ma'am. Um, he was um, a prominent member of, of the Soviet uh, government, and, and he was connected with Joseph Stalin going back into the late 1930s. Um, it, the, after Stalin died, um, there was this competition for power between Khrushchev and then a couple other guys. One guy's name was Beria, and another guy's name was... Beria was the leader of the Soviet secret police, um, and a third guy was... Um, I can't remember his name right now... Um, and large, from, from my understanding, those two guys were really competing against each other, and he kind of came in the back door, basically, and, and ultimately won over the, the Politburo. But this is not my area of expertise, so I've got to apologize for that one. Uh, so Khrushchev becomes the leader. We've got a couple other factors that are going to lead to this easing of Cold War tensions in the 1950s that is known as the thaw in the Cold War. That's kind of a weird phrasing. Because the Cold War is like tense, right? But then we talked about the Korean War being hot. Like that's actually, like hot war is violent war. So you'd think like thawing the Cold War is getting you closer to being hot. No, thawing is actually good. So ooh, frigid tension, we don't like this. Ah, so now we're, now we're it's, it's better, it's thawing out. So this thaw of the 1950s is going to have a couple other factors. In addition to just new leadership in Eisenhower and Khrushchev. First of all, remember Winston Churchill? Winston Churchill, former Prime Minister of England in, during World War II, then went on the speaking circuit, gave the Iron Curtain speech, said in 1946 that, that, that the Soviet threat is every bit as dangerous as the Nazi threat was in 1936, and we need to stop it now. By the 1950s, Churchill changes his tune. And Churchill advocates for more communication between the Americans and the Soviets. Why do you think Winston Churchill would now be against using force against the Soviets. They've got the bomb. Having the bomb changes the equation. And do you think Winston Churchill can close his eyes and remember what it was like to have German planes flying above London in the Battle of Britain? Absolutely. So do you think it, he has to stretch his imagination too much to imagine a Soviet plane flying over England and possibly dropping an atomic bomb? That would be a problem. So the, the, the existence of nuclear weapons changes the equation. Now, what's when Winston Churchill is going to be Prime Minister again of England for a couple years in the early 1950s. Uh, is he that big of a deal? Eh. He's, a, he's a prominent voice in, in global politics. And he even is advocating for more communication between these two sides. But maybe even a bigger driving force is economics. Both sides, the United States and the Soviet Union, are sp spending tremendous amounts of money to maintain this massive military buildup. The Soviet Union never drew down their military after World War II. The United States did temporarily, but now we're growing again with the Korean War and NSC 68. 
both Eisenhower and Khrushchev want to be able to spend less money on their militaries so they can direct more money elsewhere in the, their economies. Eisenhower wants to lower taxes. This is a little bit of a side note to history. Does anybody know what, do you guys know how our tax system works in the United States, our federal income tax? You guys aware of that at all? No, you just know that money sometimes gets taken out of your paychecks? Anybody know anything about our federal income tax system? Mm. It's a progressive tax. And what does that mean, Kevin? It means that the higher up that you go in the income ladder, the more percentage of your income is taxed. Very good. When you're talking about taxes, progressive taxes tax wealthier people at a higher rate. Regressive taxes tax wealthier people either at the same rate or even less or lower rates than um, than poor Americans. Now, there's some aspects to our tax system, our tax code, that many would argue are totally regressive. For example, if you are somebody like, like Bill Gates or Mark Zuckerberg, who does not need to work another moment of their lives, they don't earn income from a job, they don't have to earn income from a job at all for the rest of their lives, but they earn millions or billions of dollars every year on investment earnings. Well, in the United States, we tax investment earnings at a much lower rate than we tax income earnings. And some would argue that that's problematic, but you guys get to decide on that on your own. For our federal income tax, the money you pay on the money you earn, we have what's called a graduated schedule, a graduated tax schedule, which means like a graduated cylinder in your science class, like uh, numbers go up. As you, go, as you earn more money, you pay a higher tax uh, rate on, on that money. But everybody pays the exact same rate on the exact same dollars that they earn. My point is, when Mark Zuckerberg earns his first $10,000, and Bill Gates earns his first $10,000, and I earn my first $10,000, and you earn your first $10,000, we all pay 10% on that. Now, it takes me, like, I don't know, five weeks, six weeks to earn $10,000 might take you guys a year to earn $10,000. It might take Mark Zuckerberg, you know, a trip to the bathroom to earn $10,000. I don't know how you, you probably earn it pretty quick. Uh, but on all of that first money that we earn in the year, we pay 10%. And then the next chunk of your income, it's up to about $40,000. We pay 15%. And then the next chunk of your income, you pay 25%. Then you pay 28%, and then you pay uh, 34%, and then you pay that, what is today the top marginal tax rate. So uh, once you're over $400,000 in earnings, anybody want to take a guess? What the wealthiest Americans, what the wealthiest earners pay on their, their top dollars? 74 39.5%. All right? 39.5%. And that's higher today than it was. You guys might have heard of something called the Bush tax cuts. From, from years past. It's became a hot button issue in presidential elections of, of the last decade. The Bush tax cuts lowered everybody's tax rates, but the, that top bracket was lowered from about 39% to about 35%. And, you know, if you cut my taxes by 5%, I'm feeling pretty good. If you cut a millionaire's taxes by 5%, he's making a lot of, he's bringing home a lot of extra money. So that's why disproportionately, even though the percentage decreases might have been similar, proportionally, you know, 5% of a million dollars is far greater than 5% of $100,000. Anyway, our highest tax break bracket today is 39%. I think it's 39.4%. Our highest tax bracket today is 39%. During World War II and the years after World War II, the top marginal tax bracket in our government was 93%. I know. Blows a lot of people's minds when they hear that. The wealthiest Americans back in the 1940s, to get through World War II and into the early 1950s, were paying 90% or over 90% of their earnings, uh, of their top earnings, I should say, because they still paid the same on their lower earnings as everybody else. But on their top earnings, they were paying over 90% to the federal government. And President Eisenhower, as a Republican who advocated for the lowering of federal taxes, especially in light of the end of World War II and the end of the Korean War, wanted to bring those rates down. And they did start to come down a little bit. But they would still be in the 70% through the 1970s. 
It's Ronald Reagan and his tax cuts that would lower those to numbers that we would recognize today. So anyway, Eisenhower wanted to lower the tax burden. You can only do that if we can lower our military expenditures. Khrushchev also wanted to lower his nation's military expenditures because in the Soviet Union, the government is responsible for all production, whether it be civilian production or military production. So any spending that is going in, in the Soviet Union, any spending going towards military production, that is spending that is not going towards civilian goods. And in the Soviet Union, they were lacking civilian consumer goods. Good? Good. So let's talk about this thought. In 1955, in July of 1955, Ten years after the Potsdam Conference, the leader of the Soviet Union and the leader of the United States will meet each other in Geneva, Switzerland, called the Geneva Summit. First meeting of those heads of state since 1945. Absolutely nothing is agreed to, but they talked. So you're saying there's a chance. Okay. You guys familiar with this movie? Dumb and Dumber is too old. Okay, whatever. Yes? When was the shoe speech? Uh, that was early 60s. I want to say 61. Uh, so in 1955, they met. One proposal that Eisenhower put out there, he said, hey, why don't we have open skies? Which means if you want to fly surveillance planes over our country and we want to fly surveillance planes over your country, that would be good for everybody. Because the world could be much safer if we like, absolutely understood what each other was up to. So if we knew what you were up to and you knew what we were up to, we could all be safer. And Khrushchev said, niet, which is Russian for no. Uh, he said, no, we're not agreeing to this. So Eisenhower was like, mm, okay. But at least they met and they shook hands and they talked to each other and they were cordial. Couldn't come to agreements, but it's a first step, right? But then after 1955, we start to see an increase in tensions. Again. All right, now we've got to get into Soviet politics for just a brief moment. Khrushchev replaces, obviously, Joseph Stalin. Joseph Stalin had created, through his Stalinism, created a culture of fear and terror in the Soviet Union. Remember the talk about the purges and, you know, neighbors pointing out their neighbors who might not be loyal to, to Joseph Stalin? This was a very dangerous time. Khrushchev wanted to end Joseph Stalin's cult of personality that he had created. He wanted to end the state of terror in the Soviet Union. And in February of 1956, February of 1956, Khrushchev gives a speech at midnight to the, the, the Communist Party in Moscow that becomes known as Khrushchev's secret speech. Not much of a secret because we totally know all about it. And the word gets out of this speech. Khrushchev's secret speech. This was meant to de-Stalinize Soviet Union. Apologize if you're looking at my notes because Apple autocorrected it to the de-sterilization speech and I didn't notice it until I printed it off. This had nothing to do with that. It was to, to get Stalin out of the Soviet Union, to end Stalin's cult of personality. And this is good because Soviet people can now go like, oh. And we can talk about other things. Yeah, we can move on from the harshness of the Soviet Union under Stalin. But other people heard the secret speech as well. Mao Zedong heard the secret speech. Mao Zedong in China. And he said, this new guy, Khrushchev, that guy is weak. And this is an opportunity for me to take control of this relationship. We'll talk about that more on a later date. But Eastern Europe, yes ma'am. Because Stalin was like, iron fist, you step out of line, we crush you. And, and Khrushchev was ending that cult of fear. Well, Mao sees that as weakness on, on Khrushchev's part. In Eastern Europe, all of those Soviet satellite states that Stalin had his thumb over, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Romania, Hungary, all of those Eastern European satellite states, they are going to hear the secret speech as well. And they will start to believe that maybe the Soviet Union under Khrushchev isn't going to be like the Soviet Union under Stalin. And maybe they're going to have a little bit more freedom to veer away from the Soviet Union and head to the West. 
Because why, if you're Poland, or why, if you're Hungary, would you want to go to the West? Why would you want to? Why would you want to be friends with the Western powers like the United States rather than being under the Soviet thumb? Capitalism. Because what's happening in Western Europe because of capitalism? Yeah. Okay, yeah, they could start doing more for their exclusive benefit. Opening up trade with the West. Maybe becoming a recipient of Marshall Plan like money, right? Because Western Europe is being rebuilt by Marshall Plan money. Eastern Europe isn't. They don't have that kind of resources. So in 1956, starting in Hungary, starting in the capital of Hungary, Budapest, Hungary, in 1956, protests begin a challenge to the communist government of Budapest, a call for free elections in Hungary. And thousands of protesters in Budapest will take to the streets to demand political change in Hungary. And Khrushchev can't have that. Because if Hungary leaves, so will Poland, so will Czechoslovakia, so will Romania, so will East Germany. So you can't let that happen in Hungary if you're Khrushchev. So Khrushchev will call in his army. The Soviet Red Army will roll into Hungary and roll into the city of Budapest, and they will crush this uprising, keeping not only Hungary, but all of the Soviet satellites in their grasp. Okay? A second tension, second area of tension, happens in the Middle East. Now, can I have you guys do me a favor? Write the phrase Suez Crisis, S-U-E-Z, the Suez Crisis of 1956. And then you're going to put a little star by that or parentheses and say, see my Arab-Israeli notes that don't exist yet, but they will in a couple months. Because right now I just want you to put your pencils down, take a break as I give you the quick version of this story, which will get more detail in a couple months. All right? This is the Middle East. This is Egypt in 1956. This is Saudi Arabia. We're not going to worry much about them. This is Jordan. This is Israel. All right. Israel is a relatively new country. They were born in 1948. Upon Israel's birth, upon Israel's declaration of independence, all of Israel's neighbors, Egypt, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Iraq way over here, Syria up there, Lebanon to the north, all of, Syria, uh, all of Israel's neighbors launched an attack against this new Israeli nation. And after a, a, a relatively brief war by 20th century standards, Israel won. All right? We'll talk much more about how this happened in, in, at a later date. But Israel won. So Israel became a legitimate, recognized nation in the Middle East. But they had no friends in their region. All of their neighbors disliked them. All right? When Israel won this war... They took over more land than was originally planned to be a part of the nation of Israel, according to the United Nations. And many people, many Palestinian people in this area, were displaced. Hundreds of thousands, we're talking about a refugee crisis, you guys hear this word refugee today. This was really, uh, for many people, the, the, the birth of the refugee crises in the Middle East was this uh, first Israeli war, 1948 war, a war that Arabs call al-Nakba, uh, the catastrophe or the disaster. Uh, hundreds of thousands of Palestinian refugees left without homes or having be, being forced out of their homes after this war. Many of those refugees ended up in Jordan, some up in Syria, many over in Egypt. Fast forward a few years later. Egypt's got a revolution in 1953, and there's new leadership that comes to town. Out of this leadership, out of this revolution, comes a, a strong Arab nationalist leader and a guy named Gamal Abdel Nasser. Don't worry about it right now. You're going to get all this stuff later in the year. Nasser is, a, is an Arab nationalist. He's a leader of Egypt, but he also wants to be the leader of, like, all Arabs. And Israel is, like, number one enemy of all Arabs. And Nasser wants to use everybody's anger against Israel to solidify his power. But Nasser is the new leader of a relatively young country that is very poor, and he needs outside help. And he goes to the United States and says, America, you are doling out money left and right. 
what do you say you hook us up with a little bit of money because we want to build this big dam on this on the Nile River it's over here a little bit we want to build a big dam on the Nile River and we can use that dam for hydroelectric power and also to give us a big water reservoir today that's called Lake Nasser named after the guy we can give us a big water reservoir give us some hydroelectric power we can electrify our state but we don't have the money to do it and the United States initially says yeah I think we can hook you up with some money because we're like giving money everywhere to try to keep people from going to the Soviets but after some political pressure in the United States especially from American congressmen in the south in our cotton producing states who are a little freaked out that cotton farmers in Egypt might start producing more cotton if they get more electricity and it might drive down global prices in cotton and, and upset the world markets for cotton we pulled the plug on that money the Soviet Union also wasn't keen on hooking uh, uh, Nasser up with a lot of money at this time either we'll talk more about that later so Nasser decides hey I've got one of the most valuable resources on the globe within my country I need to take advantage of that so as he needed to find money he goes to the Suez Canal the most important waterway in the world in the mid 20th century all of the oil that makes its way up into Western Europe it's coming from the Middle East through the Red Sea through the Suez Canal this is a hugely important waterway it's controlled by a French company French company runs the Suez Canal collects the tolls makes great profits off of it Nasser is going to move to nationalize the Suez Canal he's gonna take it over for the Egyptian nation so Egypt can keep the wealth going through uh, the, the Suez Canal and then they can build their dam with it all right this is problematic though the French are quite upset about this because it's a French company that was that just lost its, its business the British are upset about this uh, because the Suez Canal is Britain's lifeline to its now friends in India it's not a colony anymore it's friends in India but also getting its oil and then also the French have another reason to not like Egypt very much because Gamal Abdel Nasser with the idea of like helping out Arab nationalist movements starts giving arms to a, a, an Algerian rebel group against the French doesn't like that and Israel doesn't like Egypt because Nasser is starting to give arms to a group of Palestinians called the Fedayeen and they're they're fighters or in Israelis mind they're terrorists or they want to regain Palestinian homeland for themselves so Nasser is ticking off a lot of people right in 1950 in the mid 1950s and in 1956 in early October of 1956 Israel and Britain and France get together outside of Paris and they have a meeting and they concoct a plan that is known as the Sever Protocol because of where, where it was originated the idea is this Israel is gonna invade Egypt because it Egypt keeps on sending Palestinian fighters across the border Israel is gonna get fed up with that and they're gonna send their army across their southern border into Egypt this is called the Sinai Peninsula they're gonna invade Egypt under the idea of stopping these in, uh, incursions into their own country and Britain and France from the outside are gonna say whoa Israel don't invade Egypt that's not cool stop fighting stop fighting get out of Egypt not cool of course Israel won't stop so Britain and France are going to send paratroopers into Egypt under the auspices of stopping this fighting but in reality to regain the Suez Canal and to destroy to knock Nasser out of power it's quite a scheme they've got going on here this is an absolute disaster what starts out as a military success like for example Israel rolled right through Egyptian forces in the Sinai Peninsula so militarily it looked like a success but when the United States and the Soviet Union got wind of what was going on here furious Eisenhower in October of 1956 October 56 what's coming in the next month a presidential election this is what's known as we're gonna talk about a few of these this could be known as an October surprise these dramatic events that happen in the October before a presidential election that nobody expected that could dramatically impact a presidential election it's an October surprise Eisenhower is furious our two greatest allies in the world France and Britain have now conspired to invade a third party without letting us know what was going on 
And had they told the United States what they were up to, we would have said, stop it. Not a good idea. Because the last thing we want is tensions in the Middle East that might force the Soviet Union to get involved. Nikita Khrushchev, for his part, went even further. He said, Britain, France, Israel, you get out of Egypt or we will use nuclear weapons. What? Yeah, like ratcheting it up a little bit here. Side note, Vladimir Putin just said yesterday, it was, it was released in, a, in an article, Vladimir Putin said nuclear weapons should be on the t- are on the table in this fight against ISIS. He said, I hope we don't use them, but they're there. So he opened that door possibility up. <laughs> Anyhow, Khrushchev threatened to use nuclear weapons to solve this crisis. This is a serious issue. It's called the Suez Crisis. Eisenhower demands Israel get out of the Sinai. Eisenhower demands that Britain and France back off. They listen. Because we're the United States and we are like largely funding Britain and France at that point. Um, not Israel at that point. We're not very fond of Israel at this point, especially for this. Yes, sir? Was Khrushchev uh, kind of trying to blow hot air to get attention off of the Budapest Revolution by saying, I, he didn't say he was going to nuke Israel necessarily, but, but to, to drive back the armies, yeah. Um, I, I think he was advocating for a friend in Egypt um, down the road. Like, hey, Egypt, we've got your back here. But this is a rare occurrence, a weird situation in the Cold War where the United States and the Soviet Union, like, agree exactly with each other that this is a bad situation. In the aftermath of the Suez Crisis... You've got Britain and France going back to Europe with their tail between their legs. Israel is backed out of the Sinai Peninsula. A United Nations force will, be, will go into Egypt to defend that border. And we'll talk more about how that, that plays out. But now the Middle East is, a, is, is going to become a new front in the Cold War story. The United States is seriously worried that we have now, that due, due to these actions, Egypt is now going to be in the Soviet camp. And we don't want that to happen. So Eisenhower will issue what is known as the Eisenhower Doctrine. It's a continuation of the Truman Doctrine, but now applied to the Middle East. The Eisenhower Doctrine says that any country in the Middle East that is threatened by communist takeover will have United States support. The Eisenhower Doctrine. Good? Good. We've got some other areas of tension. We talked about this the other day. This, of course, is Sputnik, October of 1957. Do you guys see how, the, how much is happening so fast in this story? Right? There's a lot of development happening quite quickly. In October of 57, the Soviet Union put Sputnik into low Earth orbit. It's the first artificial satellite in space. Artificial satellite, because the moon is a satellite, and it's long been there. We didn't put it there. So Sputnik is the first artificial satellite put into space. This freaked us out, because this made Americans think that the Soviet Union not only was ahead of us in the space race, but had missile capabilities far beyond what we thought they could do. In the early 1950s, the only way you can deliver a nuclear weapon to a destination is via a heavy bomber. You had to fly it there in a relatively slow and relatively low-flying plane that could drop that bomb, and it would would possibly be subject to anti-aircraft fire. It was very dangerous stuff, right? The idea now is to put nuclear warheads on long-range missiles. A rocket that puts Sputnik into space, if you just change the trajectory of that, can be a missile that has a nuclear warhead on it. So we think about the space race in terms of like putting a man on the moon and all this stuff. Yes, that's all very important. But at the same time, the rockets we're developing to go into space are the same rockets and the same technology we're developing to that can send what we call um, an intercontinental ballistic missile. Intercontinental Ballistic Missile, an ICBM, a nuclear warhead on a missile that can go 3,000 miles or more. So it can make it from one continent, essentially, to another. So this gave us concern that the Soviets were ahead of us in terms of a missile race. That there was a missile gap between the United States and the Soviets. That they were actually doing better than us in terms of missile technology. 
Now, the truth is, they weren't. The solid line is American warheads. The dotted line is Soviet warheads. And you can see through the 19... Obviously, we were first. But through the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and into the, the late 1970s, we had long had nuclear supremacy over the Soviet Union. So there really was no missile gap. But that didn't stop some American politicians and some Americans in the media from talking about a missile gap and from s making statements, despite the fact that they didn't really know, because this is classified information, making statements that there was a missile gap and that we were behind. Did I already tell you the story about the 1960 presidential debate? All right, side note, put your pencils down. 1960 presidential debate, John F. Kennedy is a Democratic candidate running against Richard Nixon, who is the Republican candidate and also the current vice president of the United States. Nixon is Eisenhower's vice president. You've all heard of Nixon. He's going to be president later. He's running against Kennedy in 1960. In the uh, lead up to this election, they have a debate. They have the first televised presidential debate. All right? In this televised debate, there's a lot of factors at play. Nixon's a little older, Kennedy's a little younger, Kennedy's vibrant, Kennedy's better looking, Nixon's not, uh, Nixon's sick, Kennedy feels good. S stories have it that, that Kennedy's people cranked up the temperature in the auditorium a little bit to make it hotter, to make Nixon even more uncomfortable. During the course of this debate, Kennedy looked really good and came off really pretty polished while Nixon was turned into kind of a sweaty mess on camera. It said after the debate that those that heard the debate on the radio thought Nixon won the debate. Those that saw the debate with their eyes on television thought Kennedy won the debate. Image matters, right? We, we kind of get that, I think. We, we all live in that world, right? That's why I have to be so good looking, to, especially now that I'm recording myself. I, I mean, can you imagine if I was an ugly teacher? I'd probably get like two views per video instead of five. Right. I know, you can't, it's, it's, no, it's beyond, right? So anyway, in this debate, in this debate, candidate Kennedy accused Richard Nixon and the Eisenhower administration of allowing the creation of a missile gap, that, that the Soviet Union had more and better missiles than the United States had, and that was a danger to us. Kennedy accused Nixon and Eisenhower of being weak against the Soviet Union and responding to their missile capabilities, that we were behind them, that a missile gap existed. Nixon knew there was no such missile gap. Our intelligence at that time said, no, we were ahead. We knew this. We felt we were ahead. We believed we were ahead. But that was top secret information. And that was classified, and Nixon was not at liberty as vice president of the United States to say, Mr. Kennedy, you're wrong. We're not. We're totally winning this game. Now, why would we not want to admit that we were totally winning the game? Yeah, because if we admitted that we're totally ahead of them, then the Soviets might, like, create a dramatic escalation of their own missile capabilities. So we were comfortable with the Soviets thinking they were ahead. That was okay by us. But for Kennedy... That was like an admission of the United States lagging behind the Soviet Union. Can you guys imagine maybe a presidential election where, where one side of the election might want to argue that the threats that we might currently be under are so damaging and the current president is not dealing with it effectively, right? Yeah, I mean, there's maybe some parallels to, to what we're living through today, right? So Kennedy, of course, is going to win that election. Kennedy becomes the next president point of the missile gap is it was never really there. Now, all of this, when the Soviet Union developed far more nuclear warheads in the 1980s and into the 1990s, that doesn't concern us. Ours, they had more, we, we were operating more of a quantity, like once, you, once you're starting to get to 20,000 nuclear warheads, that's enough. <laughs> That'll do it. Like having 40,000 versus 20,000, it doesn't really make much of a difference, right? Okay, they, they, we're still okay. And we believe that our nuclear arsenal, and it, it, there's truth to this, we believe that our missiles were better, our, 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 our bombing cap capabilities were stronger, uh, our nuclear weapons could be more precise. Uh, we, we believed that, that we had uh, still nuclear supremacy. 
Good? Good. Last bit of the story. Last bit of the story. In 1959, in, in 1959, September of 1959, or pardon me, where am I either? In 1959, the United States President Eisenhower and um, Nikita Khrushchev will meet again, this time in Washington, D.C., for a second summit. Again, there are no results that come out of this, no, no concrete results on any issues at the time. But they meet again, they talk, they have a nice gala dinner, everybody's having a good time. <coughs> There's notions of what's called the spirit of Camp David. Camp David is the U.S. president's retreat outside of Washington, D.C. Uh, there's like just an era of good feelings here. Hey, maybe, maybe we can be okay, maybe we can coexist. But this would all be crushed in May of 1960. We're looking at the picture here. This is Eisenhower. Khrushchev, this is Eisenhower's wife, Mamie Eisenhower, and this is Khrushchev's wife, don't know her name. Then on May 1st, 1960, on May 1st, 1960, all of that optimism built by, by that last summit, Khrushchev had invited Eisenhower to go to the Soviet Union, be the first American president in the Soviet Union since the Yalta Convention, all right? On May 1st, 1960, which incidentally, May 1st is like the international workers' holiday. It's like a national holiday in communist states. On May 1st, 1960, an American spy plane called the U-2, a U-2, high-altitude reconnaissance plane. Time out. Did anybody see on HBO the other night the U-2 concert from Paris that was supposed to be held the night, supposed to be held the night after the, uh, the Paris attacks? It was awesome. It was, if you haven't seen it and you have HBO, go on and watch it. It was so good. Did you watch it, Elmira? I heard about it. You heard about it. Yeah, the band, the band that played at the Bataclan during that incident, um, they were brought on stage. It was awesome. Bono, the lead singer of U2, said, said you know, you guys had your stage stolen from, uh, from you, so we're going to give you ours tonight. And it was like a goosebumpy. It was, it was really awesome. If you can catch any of it, like watch the last hour. I'm getting goosebumps right now even thinking about it. It was awesome. It was like very much a, a let's stand together. And, and it was good stuff. What a great band. Anyhow, that band named itself after this plane. So... This is a U-2 high-altitude reconnaissance plane. A top secret military plane, of the, or actually CIA plane, uh, that the United States flew over various countries of the world and took pretty high-resolution pictures of what was happening on the ground. Pretty soon we're going to talk about the Cuban Missile Crisis. We knew there were missiles on Cuba because one of these flew over Cuba and took pictures of it happening. So this is a U-2 high-altitude reconnaissance plane meant to fly over enemy territory, take pictures of what was going on. Remember, Eisenhower wanted open skies. He wanted to be able to fly over and take pictures, and Khrushchev said no. So this is like totally illegal. Flying over another nation's airspace when you're not welcome is not cool. And we did. And on May 1st, 1960, a U-2 plane was shot down over the Soviet Union. Part of the thing about the U-2 is they could fly over 70,000 feet in the air. It's pretty high. Your airplanes that you guys fly to Florida on go at about 35,000 feet. So this is twice the altitude of a normal plane. All right, that's way up there. So 70,000 feet up in the air, one of these planes is shot down. We didn't think the Soviets had anti-aircraft technology that could shoot down a plane that high. Yes? Why did Eisenhower let it fly over? Because we wanted to see what they were doing. I, if I'm your little brother, I'm going to say, hey, big sis, can I read your diary? And you're going to be like, no. And then I'm going to sneak around and see if I can get on, in there on my own, right? So I'm gonna ask, I might ask you first, because you might say, yeah, and then, and then we're cool. But if you say no, which I assume you're going to say, oh, I still have to do it anyway. I still want to know what you're up to, right? And they, okay, they had, they had good relate. They met with each other. They had dinner with each other. But we, they, the Soviet Union still had nuclear warheads pointing at us, and we still had nuclear warheads pointing at them. Yes, sir? Well, if the Soviet Union was making some super bomb, that was, you know, like, I don't know, and the 
Cold War for their, in their favor when they tell us? Yeah, we didn't trust them. They didn't trust us, but we didn't trust them. Anyway, May 1st, 1960, one of these planes was shot down over the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union says, we shot down an American plane over our uh, airspace. American response is, no, nothing to see here, Khrushchev, move along. It was but a weather plane that went off course. No worries. Khrushchev says, you're lying because we have your plane. We have your plane. We have your plane. We have your cameras. We have your film. This is no weather plane, right? And we're like, yeah. And then the Soviet Union said, we also have your pilot. His name is Jimmy Kimmel. He's going to later go on to a, a... No, I'm kidding. I think it looks a lot like Jimmy Kimmel. But his name is actually... His name is actually Francis Gary Powers. Francis Gary Powers, the American pilot of that plane. Can you imagine being shot, having your plane shot out from under you at 70,000 feet and having to parachute down? And he survived. We had no idea that he was alive. The Soviet Union released that information. Now we got a problem because we want our guy back. This is an issue. And so President Eisenhower maybe is a little example to future presidents and future leaders of the United States and how, how to act in a situation like this. Eisenhower admits it. He says, yep, we were spying on you. We were illegally flying over your airspace and taking pictures of what you were up to. That is absolutely true. But he wouldn't apologize. He didn't say sorry for doing it. My bad. He didn't apologize. Instead, he said, aerial surveillance, aerial surveillance, like us taking pictures of you guys from, from above, is a distasteful, we don't like it, blah, we wish we didn't have to do it, it's a distasteful but vital necessity. In Eisenhower's mind, us flying over and taking pictures of the Soviet Union kept us all safer. Like Kevin said, we, if we knew what the Soviet Union was up to, having a little bit of an understanding of what each other was up to, kept us, kept us from possibly overreacting, kept us from taking steps that might possibly lead to nuclear war. Khrushchev is furious. He cancels Ike's trip to Moscow. No summit for you, Eisenhower. The thaw of the Cold War will come to an abrupt end. And in our next two classes, we will talk about escalating tensions in two other parts of the world. Berlin, again, we'll talk about that in our next class. And then, even more seriously, Cuba. So, a brief thaw in the Cold War comes to a crashing end with the U-2 plane, and now we've got more threats.